Breathe love. Breathe love. Boom. Boom. Hi, everybody. I'm Greg. Welcome to Park Avenue Church in Minneapolis. Uh, I'm really glad you're here to worship with us online today. Uh, as you may know, earlier today, May, which is May 2nd, um, we began opening up for in-person worship in our sanctuary. Of course, masks and social distance. So if you're here or find yourself in the Twin Cities area and want to join us in person, man, it would be great and we would love to welcome you. Plus, I want you to know that as we begin in-person worship, we're going to continue our online worship option uh, and we're going to be transitioning to a new look. We're testing out now a live stream option for our worship service. So if, if all goes well, perhaps beginning next week, you'll be able to participate online with us in a live streamed way uh, or you could view the live stream recording at another time. And we continue to partner, I'm excited about this, with the Minneapolis Department of Health as a vaccination site to provide access uh, to the vaccination uh, in our neighborhood. Uh, I think it's several hundred people now have been, over 400 have been uh, vaccinated because uh, Park Avenue, we're here on this block. Uh, and it makes a difference that we're here. So if you need help getting a vaccination or know someone who does, uh, please let us know so we can connect you. Just email us at info at parkavchurch.org. So now let's continue uh, with this call to worship. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, the one who tends us, guides us into pastures, who speaks every language and recognizes the sounds of our names in every tongue. I, he says, I am the good shepherd, the one who bends to heal us, travels through the deepest valleys with us, who gives up everything for us all. He says, I'm the good shepherd, the one who comforts us, whose strength and love holds us, whose cup of love spills over. I am the good shepherd, he says, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's gather here, God's people in God's love for God's world. Let's worship together. Change when I go. 
And now as we prepare our hearts for prayer, I invite you to listen in as our young people of Park Avenue lead us in intercessions. A radiant, radiant light, light. A, a flame, flame divine. divine. As, as shines the light, light of morning's, morning's dawn. dawn. Come, comes bless, bless the, the embers of the earth. Embers of the earth. Sparks, Sparks flung from our, from our internal birth. A word, a of, word God, of God. The source, the source of, life. of life. You rouse us from the night of fears. To open, to souls, open souls and minds and, and, and ears. And hear, and the, hear music the music of the spheres. spheres. You are the fire that births all things. That birthed all thing. The force that spins the, the galaxies. The force that spins the galaxies. You are the you flame. You are the flame. Within all flames. Within all flames. The hidden power. The hidden power that knows, that knows no name. From you, From you all, all things, things that, that are were, were sent. sent. And into you does all and extend. Into you does all Peel back the bark of any tree. Lift up a stone. Lift up a stone. They blaze with thee. Oh, oh happy, happy light. light. We feel, we feel your heat. The starlight shining in our bones. We fill us with all cosmic, all cosmic grace. We host your presence in this place. Despite the sting of 
And together, let us pray the prayer that our Lord taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. And all God's people together said, Amen and Amen. Our scripture today is John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. And if you want to follow along, I'm reading from the NRSV, New Revised Standard Version. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand doesn't care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them in also. And they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the word of God for the people of God. Say it with me. Thanks be to God. Well, I'll say one thing about this pandemic. It's given us a space to rethink what matters. It's forced us to ask questions about what we value and in some cases allowed us to reorient ourselves to what it means to be the church and a people of faith. 
Early on in the pandemic, I was having a conversation with a friend. We talked about the challenges of not being able to be with people, how much we missed the live human interaction of worshiping together and the not the sameness <laughs> of digital contact, right? And he made a comment that made me think. He said, well, God has been virtual for a long time. God has been virtual for a long time. And I think he meant it as a way to say that the coronavirus doesn't restrict the spirit of God. God can and does move to connect us even through the internet and digital images, the virtuality of it all, which I agree with. But there's something about God has been virtual for a long time that it unsettles me. And so one of the definitions of virtual is this, existing, seen, or happening online or on a computer screen rather than in person or in the physical world. So we've had virtual coffee, virtual small groups, virtual school, virtual meetings, virtual worship and offerings and prayer rather than actual in-person, in the flesh, human contact with each other. And even though there's no denying all this virtuality has been and is a gift, it's necessary for health, helpful for folks who cannot join us in person for a number of reasons and, and will continue to, to do it. But ultimately, if God is virtual too, I'm not sure what to do with that. If God is virtual, doesn't that raise all kinds of questions? I mean, if God is virtual, why even bother working to regather together? Why hold someone's hand to pray? What's the purpose of hearing the beautiful mix of voices as we sing together or physically looking into each other's eyes to see the light and love shining through? Why not just log on, keep our distance forever and ask this virtual God to meet us in our virtual lives and virtually call it a day. <laughs> and if God is virtual, why in the world go through all the trouble of anything like the incarnation of God in Jesus? Not to mention the torture and suffering of having his body beaten and nails driven through his hands and his feet at the cross. Nothing virtual about that, let me tell you. Why would God become flesh and move into the neighborhood, as John says? Why would Jesus take on the name Emmanuel, the with us God? Why would Jesus say things like, the kingdom of God is within you, within you, and it is among you? Or things like, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger you welcomed me. I was naked. You gave me clothing. I was sick. You took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me when you did it. When you did these things to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Again, that's not virtual, my friends. That's visceral. What's the purpose of the Apostle Paul saying things like, you are the body of Christ and your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Or that your spiritual worship is actually presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God? Or that the life of Jesus is made visible in our bodies and that we have this treasure of Christ in jars of clay of our own body so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. If God is virtual, what's the point of saying stuff like that? So here's the thing. Virtual experience is not the same as Christian spirituality. And I, I think the whole point of the gospel is that it's expressed in the physicality of relationships, beginning with the in the fleshness of Jesus. It's something we see, hear, touch, smell, feel, and feel here and taste, taste and see that the Lord is good, the book says. John 
the apostle writes in his first letter to the churches in order to confront the dangers of virtualizing our spirituality. In other words, extracting it from our being humanness. We declare to you what was from the beginning, he says. He wants us to know we've seen Jesus with our own eyes, heard him with our own ears, touched him with our own hands. I'm telling you this, he says, so you can have fellowship with God and with us. I'm telling you this, so we all experience joy, the kind that fills us up and spills over to others. In other words, God became flesh and blood, a flesh and blood human being in Jesus and continues to become a f- become flesh through our humanness because indirect virtual contact does not meet our very human need for conscious contact with God and one another. And remember, so remember this, as we begin the process of regathering in person, we are created not to be alone. We're created to thrive in community, to connect, not by virtual imagery on a screen, although I hope I'm connecting with you in some way today, but through the visible, touchable image of God in human beings. You know, we are already experiencing a pandemic of disconnection, isolation, and loneliness in our world. Uh, The COVID pandemic has made it worse. And God's answer to this is to create divine human connections of grace and belonging through you, through us, through the beautiful and diverse embodied love of this church. And I don't need to tell you, something happens when we're with each other together in a shared space that does not and cannot happen when we are not. It's something of grace, something of faith, something of love, something of Well, God. And that brings me to our scripture text for today. Jesus, the good shepherd, probably one of the better known parts of the Bible. Uh, And most of us, if not all, are at least familiar with Jesus as the good shepherd and his relationship with his sheep, those he brings into the fold and those he's yet to bring in. The good shepherd cares for his sheep protects his sheep, claims ownership of his sheep. He intimately knows his sheep and opens himself so the sheep get to know him. He belongs to his sheep and the sheep know they belong with him. And because of all this, the good shepherd does all he can to make sure his sheep thrive, even to the point where he lays down his life to make sure they do. Something of God happens because Jesus, the good shepherd, is with his sheep, knows his sheep, and his sheep are with him and know him and with one another and know one another. But what jumps out to me today is this sort of broader context of Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd story in chapter 10 follows a situation in chapter 9 where we see Religion getting ugly, the healing of the man born blind, and the conflict with the religious leaders because of it. The religious authorities make clear in no uncertain terms that they've got issues with Jesus and the disruptive, crazy way he's going about things. Since Jesus doesn't conform to their understanding of God and the healed blind man doesn't fit into their traditional religious categories of who's welcomed into the fold of faith and who isn't, they refuse to accept that Jesus has healed the man. Not only do the ministerial authorities refuse to accept the man, but they take the anger that they feel for Jesus out on the man. And one of the first things the man sees after he gets his sight back is the rage on the faces of the leaders of his faith. Can you imagine the contempt, they rip into him and his parents. They insult him, ridicule him, treat him with utter contempt and ultimately cast him out of the synagogue, expel him and isolate him from the community of faith to which he belongs. 
When Jesus gets wind of this ridiculous spectacle, you know what he does? He goes looking for the man who's had his community connection cut. He goes searching for this sheep who's been shut out of the fold. And Jesus finds him. He finds him and brings him back in. So I want to say two things about this today. First, the Good Shepherd story promises that Jesus seeks anyone shut out to find them for his fold. Unlike the Good Shepherd, Jesus says to beware of hired hands who only pretend to care for the sheep. Folks like the religious leaders who expel the man Jesus heals of blindness from his community of belonging. They operate in this world, these hired hands, with promise to trust them, but will end up tearing you apart. They lure you in to leave you alone. They promise to save, but are not your savior. When push comes to shove, hired hands don't lay down their lives for the sheep, but expect the sheep to lay down their lives for them. They cut you off when you threaten their comfort, but Jesus is different. His care is authentic and his comfort is real. His promises don't tear you apart. They make you whole. He promises to save and is your savior. He lays down his life, goes to hell and back to make sure that we know that. And I guess this resonates with me, uh, particularly this year, because even though we're not in the same situation of the the blind man who was healed, who's locked out of his community of belonging, we're beginning to come out of a long, challenging experience of being separated from our fold. We know the pain of being shut out, the disconnection and isolation from one another. We've missed that something of God that happens when we're together, which does not happen when we're separated. And that is the power of belonging to empower our believing. From the very beginning, in the book, when God said to human beings, hey, it's not a good thing for you to be alone. (laughs) God's design for believing has always been conditioned by God's desire for belonging. In other words, Trusting God is worked out in the company of people we know we can trust. Faith is caught more than taught. I heard someone say that when Jesus said, where two or three are gathered, I am with them also. He wasn't letting everyone know that he's some sort of diva who requires a guaranteed minimum audience before agreeing to make a personal appearance. He's communicating the power of belonging to empower our believing. The design of God for community relationships to be the human conduit through which the grace of God flows. When we make room for one another, we make room for God. Who makes room for all of us? Faith, like love, is ultimately a relational endeavor, less about what you believe and more about who you're going to trust. In other words, at the core of faith is not that we believe something, but that we know we belong to someone. Believing is conditioned by our belonging. And that's at least one of the reasons Jesus goes looking for this man who's been cast out, excluded uh, from his community of belonging. In whatever space of separation or place of detachment you find yourself, listen to this. Jesus is intent on coming to you, meeting you there, to bring you into his fold of authentic belonging to be with him and with others so that your faith and joy may be full. Jesus still seeks anyone shut out to find them for his fold. The second, as sheep who belong to the good shepherd, Jesus calls us, and by that I mean anyone listening, but also Park Avenue Church. He calls us to be his fold of belonging to anyone who finds themselves shut out. I believe that when we as a church center ourselves in who Jesus is and what he does, 
as uh, in this scene depicted in The Good Shepherd, we cannot help but continue to become a genuine community of radical belonging that mirrors the expansive heart of God. So correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't that how we see ourselves? Isn't that who we seek to become as a church? Now, some of you um, have heard me tell the story that late in the fall of 2019, I got a message from a district superintendent in the United Methodist Church here in Minnesota to ask if I'd be interested in having a conversation about pastoring a church in Minneapolis. And when I asked him which church, he said, Park Avenue. And you know what? The first thing that came to my mind and the first thing I said to him was, absolutely yes. And then the second thing I thought and said to him was, it's really cold there, right? <laughs> but do you know why I said that? My immediate reaction to that invitation was yes. About 31 years ago, I was finishing up seminary and I and attended a seminar at a conference somewhere. I don't remember where. Um, and I don't remember the name of the seminar or much of the content. But what I do remember is that a person was leading it who talked about the church he pastored. He described the beautiful multiracial mix of people in the church, the vibrant worship and the energy of the multicultural neighborhood we sit in. He talked about the dream to be a church where anyone and everyone is invited and welcome. He described this outpouring of tangible love expressed by the people in the church for one another in the church and in the neighborhood. And that picture he painted tapped into a deep longing in me for the church to be how God envisions it, centered in Jesus, a place of transformational belonging, a place where no matter who walks in the door, they feel a palpable sense of radical welcome and love. The, the red carpet is rolled out for them. And I said to myself, I wonder what it would be like to be part of a church like that. Not just as a pastor, but as a person. The church he described was this church, Park Avenue. The person leading that seminar was a man named Bob Stamps, and he was the pastor here at the time. And you know what? Somehow, God thought it a good idea to embed that memory in my brain so that when I got that call in the fall of 2019, I immediately said yes. And of course, one thing led to another, and then Amy and Campbell and Mallory and I packed it all up and moved from Houston to Minneapolis last summer. But I want you to know something. As wonderful as Minnesota is, we didn't move here because of Minnesota, or as my wife calls it, South Canada. <laughs> we came here because of you. We're here because of you, because your diverse expression of faith, your courage to do over the decades what too few churches ever attempt to do. We're here because of who you are, Park Avenue, who you desire to become. We want to be part of that. Your legacy to do the often difficult work of loving one another as God loves, to locate yourself in this neighborhood and be a community of embodied belonging for one another is why we're here and thrilled to be here. We're here because you're here. I get to be your pastor, to be with you, to learn from you, to belong with you, to learn the way of faith, hope, and love with you. I get to do that because long before we met, the story of who you are and what God has done through you, this visible, tangible, visceral community of human beings who've chosen to belong to each other, reached the ears and touched the heart of someone like me over 30 years ago. I gotta tell you, I'm really glad that God in all divine wisdom decided long ago not to be virtual, not to be virtual. What about you? All of who we are, every heart touched and life changed would not have happened if God was virtual. 
That kind of thing has only happened and will continue to happen because the real God became a real person in the real Jesus. He walked a real talk, walked a real walk, lived a real life, died a real death on a real cross with real nails in his real hands and real feet. He shed real blood to heal our separation, to give us real life. The real Jesus, not a virtual one, makes a real difference in our real lives so that we, Park Avenue, can offer our our very real lives to one another in a real community of real belonging to be a real conduit of God's loving embrace. Because it's not a virtual God who loves us. Jesus still seeks anyone shut out to find them for his fold. Because it's not a virtual Jesus who calls us, we, Park Avenue, are his fold of belonging to anyone, anyone who finds themselves shut out. Sometimes in our lives We all have pain We all have sorrows But if we are wise We know that there's Always tomorrow Lean on me When you're not strong
And as we say each week, I can do all things, all things, things through, through Jesus Christ, Christ. who strengthens me. And together, and together, and then together, and together we can do all things through Jesus Christ, who strengthens us. Woo! Amen. 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 Amen.